Good morning. Welcome to this time of worship. I want to start by wishing a happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Uh, I hope that you get to spend time with your families and, and enjoy your day uh, being recognized and celebrated for all the wonderful things that you do as a father. Uh, we're privileged today to be in the presence of our Heavenly Father, to be able to go to Him and express our love to Him and, and worship Him together, to lift up His name and, uh, and to thank Him for inviting us in to his love and, and uh, making us part of his family and his kingdom and his mission in this world through sending his son, Jesus. Good morning and happy Father's Day to all our dads who are worshiping with us. Would you turn in your Bibles to the New Testament book of Ephesians chapter 4 and we will read verses 1 through 6. Again, that is Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 through 6. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Would you join me as we go before our Heavenly Father's throne? Oh, our Father in heaven, through the saving grace of Jesus, we have been adopted as your sons and daughters. You are our perfect Father, who knows us intimately from the hairs on the top of our heads to the cells at the bottom of our feet. You also know the condition of our hearts and souls. Nothing about us escapes you. Thank you for love so great that while we were your enemies, you sent your son to make a way for us. We rejoice that this gospel is salvation for the believer, but for much of the world it remains a stumbling block. Our prayer is for those who are beginning to hear your voice, calling them to return, and for their hearts to respond in repentance. As we honor and celebrate our earthly fathers, we remember that this day brings for some people joyful thoughts about the care, teaching, and presence of a good father. And for others, it can stir up pain in the memories of abuse, neglect, and absence of a bad father. We know that your heart is broken by these sins and that you have always cared for the fatherless. For all who celebrate those good memories today, we join in thanksgiving. And for all those whose memories bring hurt, we come alongside to comfort and share that burden. As your church, we ask that you hear the prayers of, of repentance and recommitment, strength and unity in Christ that are being prayed in the face of growing despair in our world. Thank you for the missions that you have given us and the promise of your strength and power. This morning, we will rejoice in the hearing of your word as it is proclaimed and ask that it accomplish in us what you have willed. May the lost hear the good news this day. We pray together in the name of Jesus. Amen. This is the second week of this series called Anchors for Our Souls. And I just wanted to acknowledge again that the concepts and categories that we'll be talking about in this series are based on a series of messages that I heard presented by Dr. John Mark Hicks. And what this series is about is five important anchors that we can and really need to have in our faith when storms come in life. Last week, we talked about the first anchor, God loves. We talked about the assurance that we can have of his unrelenting love for us. Even when things are hard, even in times of suffering, we have good reason to place our faith in the love of God. And we see his love for us displayed most clearly in his son, Jesus Christ. We also talked over the last couple of weeks about God's love being the thing that everything else grows out of. His, his love was his motivation for creation. His desire is to invite us into his love. And it's the motivation for all that he does. So the next four weeks, we're going to talk about four other anchors that are based in and rooted in God's love. And those anchors are God listens, God understands, God reigns, and God wins. And today, the anchor that we're going to be talking about uh, is one that's kind of hard for us to hold on to in difficult times, and that is that God listens. These days, we're used to more and more immediate communication. Almost everybody has a smartphone, and because of that, we're in almost constant contact with other people. And because of that constant communication, we can sometimes have unrealistic expectations. Have you ever texted somebody or, or called someone and if they don't respond within like five minutes, you felt annoyed because you expect them to just be at your constant beck and call? I have to admit that I'm guilty of that, especially with my wife sometimes. 
But I mean, we don't even, or, or we do have notifications even on text that let us know when the other person has seen our message. There's even a term called being left on read. Because when you send a text, it will say in tiny little letters underneath it, delivered when your message goes through to the other person's phone. And then it will say read when they've read it. But if they don't reply back, you've been left on read. I had a guy get mad at me a few years ago for that. He, he was trying to organize a house church near where I live. And at the time, I was on staff at another church. And he had sent me a whole bunch of Facebook Messenger messages. And on Messenger, the person sending the message can see when the other person reads it. And I responded to him when I could, but he kept sending more and more messages. And I was busy, and I couldn't get back to him every time. And one day, he showed up at my office, and he started chewing me out for not responding to him. And at one point, he said, I'm trying to run a ministry here. And I said, I know, so am I. And he stood there for a second, and then he said, oh, you're right, I didn't think about that, sorry. But we can sort of do the same thing with God sometimes. We can think, God, I've been praying, asking for help, asking for guidance or deliverance or some kind of sign, and I'm getting nothing. I'm not even sure if you're listening. And the longer we go without an answer, especially the answer that we want, the more frustrating it can be. Last week, I shared my experience with my parents both being diagnosed with cancer within a year. And I talked about how we prayed for my mom and, and she had surgery and her cancer never came back. And how we prayed for my dad and he had surgery after surgery and round after round of chemo and, and radiation and, and he died. And I mentioned that that situation was really the first real serious difficult storm that I had in my life. Up until that point, my life had been pretty easy. Sure, I had my ups and downs, and I had some things that didn't go my way, and some disappointments, but my world had not really actually been shaken deeply up until that point. So when that storm hit, I didn't have a lot of experience with expressing the kinds of things that I was feeling to God. And when we're angry or confused or feel let down by God, it can be hard for us to find a way to communicate that and to know that he's listening. Because we might think that we can't even say the kinds of things that we're feeling to God. And we can let that frustration and confusion drive a wedge between us and God. And if we feel like he's not listening to us, we can start to, to then pull away from him, especially in our prayer and, and our time in his word. But here's the thing. Listening to God helps us to trust that he is listening to us. All of us are probably familiar with the silent treatment, right? And if we're honest, we have all probably done it to somebody else before. We get mad at somebody, they offend us or upset us somehow, and we think, hmm, well, fine, I'm just not even going to talk to them. I'm not going to say anything. That'll show them. And somehow in our minds, we think that stopping that communication will make us feel better. And on top of that, we think that our silence will somehow make them understand how we feel and, and what we're thinking, which is completely backwards. The only way for someone to understand what we're feeling or, or thinking is for us to clearly communicate it to them. But we do that with God because we don't know what to say or how to say it, or, or we just don't want to say anything to him. But in scripture, we can find some words that may help us give voice to what we're feeling in times of suffering and struggle. And maybe these prayers can become our prayers if we just don't know what to say. Here's what Psalm 13, one through four says. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle, must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look at me and answer. Lord, my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. You can just feel that raw emotion coming from the writer of that psalm. He's pouring out his heart, his frustration, his doubts. He outright questions what God is doing and why. And have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like saying to God, look at me, answer me. How long do I have to live with this pain in my heart day after day? What about this passage? Psalm 74, verses 9 through 11. It says, we are given no sign from God. No prophets are left, and none of us knows how long this will be. How long will the enemy mock you, God? 
Will the foe revile your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Take it from the folds of your garment and destroy them. It's almost like he's saying, why are you standing around with your hands in your pockets? And when are you going to do something? And we can all relate to that feeling, can't we? We've had those thoughts and those feelings at some point, but have you ever talked to God that way? Have you ever expressed those things to him? It's hard to do that, I think, because most of us feel it's disrespectful to tell God something like that. Or we may be afraid that he's going to get angry if we we express those things, and things might get even worse. But as we listen to the words of these psalms in Scripture, we can see that God can accept and understand our true expressions of our feelings. I often put it this way, God's shoulders are big enough to handle our doubts and questions and frustrations. And the truth is, lament is a demonstration of trust. Because when we cry out to God, it's an expression that we trust that he's listening. But when we hear the word lament, a lot of us might not even know what to think. The Bible has a lot to say about lamenting. Almost half of the Psalms can be categorized as Psalms of lament, like the two that we read earlier. There's even a whole book in the Bible called Lamentations, but in our culture, we barely even know what that word means. Well, to lament means to passionately express grief or sorrow. And we all know what it's like to feel grief and sorrow, but oftentimes we're not good at expressing it. In fact, we usually try to avoid it, and then we end up holding it all inside. And part of that, I think, is because we feel like it's somehow bad to lament. We, we feel like we have so much to be grateful for that lamenting is a bad thing. But as we look at Scripture, we see that lament is not a negative thing and that it has some positive elements. Biblical lament has three main parts. Lament involves protest, petition, and praise. In almost every case in the Bible, we see those three things involved in expressions of lament. Even in those two psalms we read earlier that were expressing so many questions and frustrations, later we see that there is praise expressed too. Psalm 13, where the writer talks about God hiding his face from him and having sorrow in his heart day after day, in in verse 5 and 6. It says, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. And in Psalm 74, where that writer complains about God standing by and doing nothing. In verse 12, it says, but God is my king from long ago. He brings salvation on the earth. Yes, there are questions. Yes, there's discontentment with the way that things are. Yes, they petition God to do something, to take action, to rescue them, but there's also praise. There's also the acknowledgement of what God has done and hope of the good things that he will bring in the future. And that's a tough package, to have questions, frustrations, even anger at God, but also be able to proclaim his goodness at the same time. And we might wonder how we can find a way to learn to do that. Well, we find the best example of that in a place that you might expect. We find it in Jesus. When we look at Jesus in the most difficult time in his life, praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and and then as he went through his trial and he endured his crucifixion, we see our model of how we can lament and question and trust all at the same time. In the Garden, Jesus prayed that if there were any other way, that God would not make him go to the cross. He said his soul was troubled to the point of death. He sweat drops of blood because of the anguish and the stress that he was under. He was lamenting and grieving over what he knew he had to do. On the cross, in Mark 15, 34, it says, And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when Jesus said that, he was quoting from a lament psalm, Psalm 22. But you'll notice he said, my God. Jesus didn't reject his father. He didn't curse him. That relationship was still there. But at the same time, Jesus had a feeling of abandonment. Jesus knows that God has, in a sense, abandoned him to death. He knows that God could step in and save him, but he understands that he's not going to. Again, that's something that we can all understand. We've all had the feeling of, God, you chose not to act in this situation. Why? Is is there a reason for this? Is there some sort of meaning for this? Is, Is there even a plan? And there are always those people who will tell you that you shouldn't ask God why. 
that asking God why is somehow a lack of trust. But Job asked why, and Jeremiah asked why, the psalmists asked why over and over again, and, and as we saw, Jesus himself asked why. But he didn't only ask why, we also see Jesus doing other things in those same moments. In Luke 23, 34, as the Roman soldiers are mocking him and dividing up his clothes for themselves, it says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. And in verse 43, he says to one of the thieves being crucified with him, truly I tell you today, you'll be with me in paradise. In those six hours on the cross, Jesus on the one hand is saying, God, what is going on here? Why have you abandoned me? And on the other hand, he's saying, Father, forgive them. And he's giving hope to a condemned thief. And through all the lament, the questions, the pain, Jesus' final words on the cross in Luke 23, 46, Our Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And there again, he's quoting another psalm, Psalm 31, and that is a psalm of hope and praise. Ultimately, it comes down to Jesus trusting the Father's will and plan. Even when he had questions and the reality of God's plan was excruciating and painful, in those terrible moments, Jesus models for us both lament and trust. And like I said before, that, that's a hard place to get to. It takes a lifetime to learn that kind of faith. And, and you might be like me, because I'm not in that place a lot of the time. I'm usually on one end of that spectrum or the other. And it usually depends on my circumstances. Things might be going well, and I find it easy to praise God and to trust Him and, and to offer hope. But when things are hard, when suffering comes, I find it hard to do much more than to just ask why. But Jesus lived and died and rose again as the example of that protest and petition and praise. And his example gives us, us permission to lament and to ask questions. And it gives us permission to truly express our hearts to God in lament and in praise. And Jesus shows us that we can tell God how we really feel. He can handle our questions, our doubts, our emotions, and frustrations. God isn't going to disown us for not fully, understand, uh, fully understanding what we're going through. You're not going to surprise God with your feelings. I mean, he already knows how you feel and expressing it to him will help us to trust him more. Lamenting honestly with God and with each other is sort of like spiritual therapy, unburdening ourselves of the struggles that we're facing. And we need to be able to do that together as a community, as a family. We read those Psalms of lament at the beginning of this message. And the thing that we have to remember is that the book of Psalms was basically the hymn book for the people of Israel. The Psalms, including the lament Psalms, were sung in the temple and, and in different aspects of worship. Now, we sing songs together every time we have a worship service, and I love that part of our worship together. But I want you to imagine singing a song together with these kinds of themes of lament like we saw in those Psalms. Imagine if Justin got up on a Sunday morning and said, we're going to sing a new song today. It's called, Will You Forget Me Forever, Lord? Or, When Are You Finally Going to Do Something, God? That sounds silly to us, right? But those kinds of expressions have long been a part of the worship of God's people. And that's because lament is a part of life. And we need to be able to express it. We need to find ways to make space for people to work through their suffering, questions, and storms as a part of the body of Christ. Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. And we need to find ways to do that as a family here in this church. But that can be hard because it means that, that we have to have real community and, and real relationships where we can truly share what's going on in our lives. And that's why it's so important to get involved, to get plugged into a small group of some kind, some of our groups here at the church have taken a break during the summer, but we still have the, the Sunday morning group, the Bible study at 9.15 before church. We have the Thursday morning group at 10 o'clock, and the small group that meets every other Thursday at Tom and Brianne, How Brianne Howard's house is still meeting through the summer. There's also going to be more ladies' lunches and, and barbecues and potlucks and other events where you can, you can sit down and talk and get connected with people and build relationships. And it really is important because we need places where we can share and rejoice and lament and have people come alongside us and walk with us. 
And when we make those places to be honest and to lament together, healing will take place. Speaking the truth to God, because he does listen. When we rejoice, when we praise, when we question, when we lament, when we ask why, and yes, even when we ask him if he's awake and paying attention, he listens. In Romans chapter 8, Paul addresses the suffering that the Christians in Rome are going through. And he puts into words in a great way the struggle of not quite knowing how to express our laments to God. So I want to close this morning by reading verses 22 through 28 of Romans 8. It says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful that you hear us. We're grateful that we can trust you to understand us, to be able to see our hearts and our motives, even when we may not even know what to say. We're grateful for the Spirit who can help to communicate those, those wordless things and feelings that we have. And we're grateful for your word that shows us that we can lament and we can question and we can, we can wonder what's happening. And at the same time, we can give you praise and we can celebrate your goodness. And we're grateful especially for Jesus, who is the greatest example of trusting even in the midst of questions and suffering and pain. We trust you. We know that you want what's best for us. We know that you are working things together for good for those who are called according to your purpose. And we know that your definition of good is what's best. So we pray that you would help us to to express ourselves to you, to trust you enough to lay it all out on the line with you, and to know that you will walk us through that. You'll surround us with other people who love us and who love you and who will help us to bear those burdens. And we're grateful that you continue to move us forward and that you will walk us through storms in life And that your will will be done in our lives if we continue to trust. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for sending Jesus to be the way for us back to you. We pray in his name. Amen.
This is our time of communion. And I want to go back to something we talked about in the message a little bit, where we were talking about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying and lamenting, uh, grieving over what he knew was ahead of him. And here's what he prayed in uh, Luke chapter 22. It says, He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Even in that moment where really probably all that Jesus could think of was what was going to happen and and wanting to somehow avoid that, even in that instance, he was able to, to put God's will the Father's will above His own. And as we come together as a family to take communion, to have this meal together today, I want to assure you that if you are going through struggles right now, if you're going through suffering, that God knows that, that God hears you, that God understands what you're going through. And as we take the bread and the juice this morning, we can have the assurance that that Jesus knows what it's like to go through suffering. But we can also see the great things that God can accomplish even through suffering. So as we bring our own cares and our own concerns and, and our own struggles to God and lay those before him, we can also remember all that he's done for us through uh, the suffering that Jesus endured. And so we take the bread to remember the body of Jesus that was broken for us. And we take the juice together to remember his blood that was shed for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the gift of Jesus. 
Thank you that in, in his sacrifice we see that you know what it's like for us when we are facing struggles and trials and suffering. We know that you care and you, we know that you listen to us. And we're grateful that we can have that assurance to hold on to. The death and burial and the resurrection of Jesus, that is the, the very core of what our faith is based on. And we're grateful that because of that, we know that there's nothing in this world that can separate us from your love. So thank you for loving us so much. In Jesus' name, amen. This is our time of giving. A month ago or so, uh, my son's high school had a car show on a Saturday. It was a fundraiser for the senior all-night party that they had for the seniors after graduation. But there were cars of all different kinds, and there were some just really incredible restorations that were there. Cars that had been torn clear down to the frame, taken completely apart, and put back together to be just like they were on the showroom floor, however many decades ago that those cars were new. And, and a lot of them had a whole bunch of information. They would have a display out front that talked about where the car came from and where it was manufactured and all the specs of everything and, and then a process of what it took to restore it back to the way it was supposed to be. And, and sometimes they would, they would show how much it cost. And it's amazing what that kind of work can cost to, to restore a car back to original condition. And people um, uh, invest in those because they, they love them and because they, they enjoy the process of seeing something kind of come back to life again. And when we think about what we want to invest in in life, Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, I'm not trying to say that people who invest in restoring cars are doing anything wrong. That, that's a fine thing to do if you've got the money to do it. But what I want us to think about is that as Christians and, and as part of the church, we are in the restoration business too. Except we want to see people's lives restored. We want to see people set free through Jesus. We want to see people brought back, put back, in their original condition where they were supposed to be in relationship with their Heavenly Father. And we can invest in that as we give to God because the mission of the church, the reason this church exists is for that reason, to see people restored back to relationship with Jesus. And so as we give to God, we can do that as an act of worship, as an acknowledgement of how much He has blessed us with but also as an investment in the mission of Jesus in this world. Because together we can give and God can take that and, and do things with it that we could never imagine. And he can, he can move his mission forward in this world and we can be a part. And as we invest in that, our hearts are going to be drawn more toward that too. So I want to encourage you to give today. To give as an act of worship and to give as an investment into the mission of Jesus in this neighborhood, in this community, and in this world. And, and as we do that, let's invest our hearts too and invest into that mission of seeing people restored back to the way that they were supposed to be. Well, I want to thank you for being here and making time to be a part of this time of worship. I want to wish all the dads again a happy Father's Day. And I want to invite you back next week. We'll be here online and in person at the church at 1030 a.m. next Sunday. We'll continue through this uh, message series of the anchors for our souls. We'll talk about how God cares for us. Let's pray as we get ready to sing our closing song for the day. Father, we're grateful that you do listen. You hear us when we pray that you care, that you're at work, that you see us, that you understand us, you know our hearts and our minds, and, and uh, you, you, you're not absent. You're, you're not uh, asleep. You're not turned away from us. And sometimes we don't understand, and sometimes we go through suffering. But help us to, to express that to you in an appropriate way and to, uh, to trust you and to find the strength to praise you even though we're going through times of, of struggle. We love you, and we do trust you, and we thank you for always listening. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Oh, Lord, oh, 